They were partners. The avuncular title was bestowed on them by Cedar Camp, possibly in recognition of a certain matured good humor, quite distinct from the spasmodic exuberant spirits of its other members, and possibly from what to its youthful sense seemed their advanced ages, which must have been at least forty. They had also set habits even in their improvidence, lost incalculable and unpayable sums to each other over euchre regularly every evening, and inspected their sluice boxes punctually every Saturday for repairs, which they never made. They even got to resemble each other after the fashion of old married couples, or rather, as in matrimonial partnerships, were subject to the domination of a stronger character although in their case it is to be feared that it was the feminine Uncle Billy, enthusiastic, imaginative, and loquacious, who swayed the masculine, steady-going, and practical Uncle Jim. They had lived in the camp since its foundation in 1849, and there seemed to be no reason why they should not remain there until its inevitable evolution into a mining town. The younger members might leave through restless ambition or a desire for change or novelty. They were subject to no such trifling mutation. Yet Cedar Camp was surprised one day to hear that Uncle Billy was going away. The rain was softly falling on the bark thatch of the cabin with a muffled murmur, like a sound heard through sleep. The southwest trades were warm even at that altitude, as the open door testified, although a fire of pine bark was flickering on the adobe hearth, and striking out answering fires from the freshly scoured culinary utensils on the rude sideboard, which Uncle Jim had cleaned that morning with his usual serious persistency. Their best clothes, which were interchangeable and worn alternately by each other on festal occasions, hung on the walls, which were covered with a coarse sailcloth canvas instead of lath and plaster and were diversified by pictures from illustrated papers and stains from the exterior weather. Two bunks, like ship's berths, an upper and lower one, occupied the gable end of this single apartment, and on beds of coarse sacking filled with dry moss were carefully rolled their respective blankets and pillows. They were the only articles not used in common, and whose individuality was respected. Uncle Jim, who had been sitting before the fire, rose as the square bulk of his partner appeared at the doorway with an armful of wood for the evening stove. By that sign he knew it was nine o'clock. For the last six years Uncle Billy had regularly brought in the wood at that hour, and Uncle Jim had as regularly closed the door after him and set out their single table containing a greasy pack of cards taken from its drawer, a bottle of whiskey, and two tin drinking cups. To this was added a ragged memorandum book and a stick of pencil. The two men drew their stools to the table. Hold on a minute, said Uncle Billy. His partner laid down the cards as Uncle Billy extracted from his pocket a pill box, and, opening it, gravely took a pill. This was clearly an innovation on their regular proceedings, for Uncle Billy was always in perfect health. "'What's this for?' asked Uncle Jim, half scornfully. "'Agin Ager.' "'You ain't got no Ager,' said Uncle Jim, with the assurance of intimate cognizance of his partner's physical condition. "'But it's a powerful preventive. Quinine. Saw this box at Riley's store and laid out a quarter on it. We can keep it here comfortable for evenings. It's mighty soothing. Our old man's done a hard day's work on the river bar. Take one.' Uncle Jim gravely took a pill and swallowed it, and handed the box back to his partner. "'We'll leave it on the table sociable-like, in case any of the boys come in,' said Uncle Billy, taking up the cards. "'Well, how do we stand?' Uncle Jim consulted the memorandum book. "'You were owing me sixty-two thousand dollars on the last game, and the limit seventy-five thousand. "'Gee willikins!' ejaculated Uncle Billy. "'Let me see.' He examined the book, feebly attempted to challenge the additions, but with no effect on the total. We ought to have made the limit a hundred thousand, he said seriously. Seventy-five thousand is only trifling in a game like ours, and you've set down my claim at Angel's, he continued. 
I allowed you ten thousand dollars for that, said Uncle Jim with equal gravity, and it's a fancy price, too. The claim in question being an unprospected hillside ten miles distant, which Uncle Jim had never seen, and Uncle Billy had not visited for years, the statement was probably true nevertheless. Uncle Billy retorted, You can never tell how these things will pan out. Why, only this morning I was taking a turn round shot uphill, that she know is just rotten with quartz and gold, and I couldn't help thinking how much it was like my old claim at Angel's. I must take a day off to go on there and strike a pick in it, if only for luck. Suddenly he paused and said, Strange, ain't it? You should speak of it tonight. Now I call that queer. He laid down his cards and gazed mysteriously at his companion. Uncle Jim knew perfectly that Uncle Billy had regularly once a week for many years declared his final determination to go over to Angel's and prospect his claim. Yet nevertheless he half responded to his partner's suggestion of mystery, and a look of fatuous wonder crept into his eyes. But he contented himself by saying cautiously, You spoke of it first. That's the more singular, said Uncle Billy confidently, and I've been thinking about it, and kind of seeing myself thar all day. It's mighty queer. He got up and began to rummage among some torn and coverless books in the corner. Where's that dream book gone to? The Carson boys borrowed it, replied Uncle Jim. Anyhow, yours wasn't no dream, only a kind of vision, and the book don't take no stock in visions. Nevertheless, he watched his partner with some sympathy, and added, That reminds me that I had a dream the other night of being in Frisco at a small hotel with heaps of money, and all the time being sort of scared and bewildered over it. No, queried his partner, eagerly yet reproachfully. You never let on anything about it to me. It's mighty queer you having these strange feelings, for I've had them myself. And only tonight, coming up from the spring, I saw two crows hopping in the trail, and I says, if I sees another, it's luck sure. And you'll think I'm lying, but when I went to the woodpile just now, there was the third one sitting up on a log as plain as I see you. Tell you what folks can laugh, but that's just what Jim Filgree saw the night before he made that big strike. They were both smiling yet with an underlying credulity and seriousness as singularly pathetic as it seemed incongruous to their years and intelligence. Small wonder, however, that in their occupation and environment, living daily in an atmosphere of hope, expectation, and chance, looking forward each morning to the blind stroke of a pick that might bring fortune, they should see signs in nature and hear mystic voices in the trackless woods that surrounded them. Still less strange that they were peculiarly susceptible to the more recognized diversions of chance, and were gamblers on the turning of a card who trusted to the revelation of a shovelful of upturned earth. It was quite natural, therefore, that they should return from their abstract form of divination to the table and their cards, but they were scarcely seated before they heard a crackling step in the brush outside, and the free latch of their door was lifted. A younger member of the camp entered. He uttered a peevish, Hello, which might have passed for a greeting, or might have been a slight protest at finding the door closed, drew the stool from which Uncle Jim had just risen before the fire, shook his wet clothes like a Newfoundland dog, and sat down. Yet he was by no means churlish nor coarse-looking, and this act was rather one of easy-going, selfish, youthful familiarity than of rudeness. The cabin of Uncles Billy and Jim was considered a public right, or common, of the camp. Conferences between individual miners were appointed there. I'll meet you at Uncle Billy's was a common tryst. Added to this was a tacit claim upon the partner's arbitrative powers, or the equal right to request them to step outside if the interviews were of a private nature. Yet there was never any objection on the part of the partners, and tonight, there was not a shadow of resentment of this intrusion in the patient, good-humored, tolerant eyes of uncles Jim and Billy as they gazed at their guest. Perhaps there was a slight gleam of relief in Uncle Jim's when he found that the guest was unaccompanied by anyone, and that it was not a tryst. 
It would have been unpleasant for the two partners to have stayed out in the rain while their guests were exchanging private confidences in their cabin. While there might have been no limit to their goodwill, there might have been some to their capacity for exposure. Uncle Jim drew a huge log from beside the hearth and sat on the driest end of it, while their guest occupied the stool. The young man, without turning away from his discontented, peevish brooding over the fire, vaguely reached backward for the whiskey bottle and Uncle Billy's tin cup, to which he was assisted by the latter's hospitable hand. But on setting down the cup, his eye caught sight of the pill-box. "'What's that?' he said with gloomy scorn. "'Rat poison? Quinine pills. Agin agar,' said Uncle Jim. "'The newest thing out. Keeps out damp like Injun rubber. Take one to follow your whiskey. Me and Uncle Billy wouldn't think of settin' down quiet-like in the evening, out of work, without em. Take one. You're welcome. We keep em out here for the boys.' Accustomed as the partners were to adopt and wear each other's opinions before folks, as they did each other's clothing, Uncle Billy was nevertheless astonished and delighted at Uncle Jim's enthusiasm over his pills. The guest took one and swallowed it. "'Mighty bitter,' he said, glancing at his hosts with a quick Californian suspicion of some practical joke. But the honest faces of the partners reassured him. "'That bitterness ye taste?' said Uncle Jim quickly, is why the thing's getting its work. Sort of sickening the malaria and kind of waterproofing the insides all to onct and at the same lick. Don't you see? Put another in your vest pocket. You'll be crying for him like a child afore you get home. There. Well, how's things a-going on your claim, Dick? Boomin', eh? The guest raised his head and turned it sufficiently to fling his answer back over his shoulder at his host's. I don't know what you'd call boomin', he said gloomily. I suppose you two men sitting here comfortably by the fire, without caring whether school keeps or not, would call two feet of backwater over one's claim boomin'. I reckon you'd consider a hundred and fifty feet of sluicin' carried away and drifting to thunder down the South Fork, something in the way of advertising to your old camp. I suppose you'd think it was an inducement to investors. I shouldn't wonder." he added still more gloomily, as a sudden dash of rain down the wide-throated chimney dropped in his tin cup. And it would be just like you two chaps, sitting there gormandizing over your quinine, if you said this rain that lasted three weeks was something to be proud of. It was the cheerful and the satisfying custom of the rest of the camp, for no reason whatever, to hold Uncle Jim and Uncle Billy responsible for its present location, its vicissitudes, the weather, or any convulsion of nature. And it was equally the partner's habit, for no reason whatever, to accept these animate versions and apologize. It's a rain that's soft and mellowin', said Uncle Billy gently, and supplin to the sinews and muscles. Did you ever notice, Jim, ostentatiously to his partner, did you ever notice that you get into a kind of sweaty lather workin' in it, sort of openin' to the pores? Fetches em every time, said Uncle Billy. Better nor fancy soap. Their guest laughed bitterly. Well, I'm going to leave it to you. I reckon to cut the whole concern tomorrow and light out for something new. It can't be worse than this. The two partners looked grieved, albeit they were accustomed to these outbursts. Everybody who thought of getting away from Cedar Camp used it first as a threat to these patient men, after the fashion of runaway nephews, or made an exemplary scene of their going. "'Better think twice afore you go,' said Uncle Billy. "'I've seen worse weather afore you came,' said Uncle Jim slowly. "'Water all over the bar, the mud so deep ye couldn't get to angels for a sack of flour, and we had to grub on pine nuts and jackass rabbits.' and yet we stuck by the camp, and here we are. The mild answer apparently goaded their guest to fury. He rose from his seat, threw back his long dripping hair from his handsome but querulous face, and scattered a few drops on the partners. Yes, that's just it. That's what gets me. Here you stick, and here you are, and here you'll stick and rust until you starve or drown. Here you are, Two men who ought to be out in the world playing your part as grown men, stuck here like children playing house in the woods, playing work in your wretched mud-pie ditches and content. 
Two men not so old that you mightn't be taking your part in the fun of the world, going to balls or theaters or paying attention to girls, and yet old enough to have married and have your families around you, content to stay in this God-forsaken place. Old bachelors pigging together like poorhouse paupers. That's what gets me. Say you like it. Say you expect by hanging on to make a strike. And what does that amount to? What are your chances? How many of us have made or are making more than grub wages? Say you're willing to share and share alike as you do. Have you got enough for two? Aren't you actually living off each other? Aren't you grinding each other down, choking each other's struggles as you sink together deeper and deeper in the mud of this cussed camp? And while you're doing this, aren't you by your age and position here holding out hopes to others that you know cannot be fulfilled? Accustomed as they were to the half-querulous, half-humorous, but always extravagant criticism of the others, there was something so new in this arraignment of themselves that the partners for a moment sat silent. There was a slight flush on Uncle Billy's cheek, and there was a slight paleness on Uncle Jim's. He was the first to reply, but he did so with a certain dignity which neither his partner nor their guest had ever seen on his face before. "'As it's our fire that's warmed ye up like this, Dick Bullen,' he said, slowly rising, with his hand resting on Uncle Billy's shoulder, "'and as it's our whiskey that's loosened your tongue, I reckon we must put up with what you're saying, just as we've managed to put up with our own way of living, and not quarrel with ye under our roof.' The young fellow saw the change in Uncle Jim's face, and quickly extended his hand with an apologetic backward shake of his long hair. Hang it all, old man, he said with a laugh of mingled contrition and amusement. You mustn't mind what I said just now. I've been so worried thinking of things about myself, and maybe a little about you, that I quite forgot I hadn't a call to preach to anybody, least of all to you. So we part friends, Uncle Jim, and you too, Uncle Billy, and you'll forget what I said. In fact, I don't know why I spoke at all. Only I was passing your claim just now, and wondering how much longer your old sluice boxes would hold out, and where in thunder you'd get others when they've caved in. I reckon that sent me off. That's all, old chap. Uncle Billy's face broke into a beaming smile of relief, and it was his hand that first grasped his guests. Uncle Jim quickly followed with his honest a pressure, but with eyes that did not seem to be looking at Bullen though all trace of resentment had died out of them. He walked to the door with him, again shook hands, but remained looking out in the darkness some time after Dick Bullen's tangled hair and broad shoulders had disappeared. Meantime, Uncle Billy had resumed his seat and was chuckling and reminiscent as he cleaned out his pipe. Kind of reminds me of Joe Sharp, when he was cleaned out at poker by his own partners in his own cabin, coming up here and bedeviling us about it, what was it you lent him? But Uncle Jim did not reply, and Uncle Billy, taking up the cards, began to shuffle them, smiling vaguely, yet at the same time somewhat painfully. After all, Dick was mighty cut up about what he said, and I felt kind of sorry for him. And you know I rather cotton to a man that speaks his mind. Sort of clears him out, you know, of all the slumgullion that's in him. It's like washing out a pan of prospecting. You pour in the water, and keep slushing it around and round, and out comes first the mud and dirt, and then the gravel, and then the black sand, and then it's all out, and there's a speck of gold glistening at the bottom. Then you think there was something in what he said, said Uncle Jim, facing about slowly. An odd tone in his voice made Uncle Billy look up. No, he said quickly, shying with the instinct of an easy, pleasure-loving nature from a possible grave situation. No, I don't think he ever got the color. But what are we mooning about for? Ain't you going to play? It's more than half past nine now. Thus adjured, Uncle Jim moved up to the table and sat down, while Uncle Billy dealt the cards, turning up the jack or right bower, but without that exclamation of delight which always accompanied his good fortune. Nor did Uncle Jim respond with the usual corresponding simulation of deep disgust. Such a circumstance had not occurred before in the history of their partnership. 
They both played in silence, a silence only interrupted by a larger splash of raindrops down the chimney. We ought to put a couple of stones on the chimney top, edgewise, like Jack Curtis does. It keeps out the rain without interfering with the draft, said Uncle Billy musingly. What's the use if— If what? said Uncle Billy quietly. If we don't make it broader, said Uncle Jim half wearily. They both stared at the chimney, but Uncle Jim's eye followed the wall around to the bunks. There were many discolorations on the canvas, and the picture of the goddess of liberty from an illustrated paper had broken out in a kind of damp, measly eruption. I'll stick that funny handbill of the wash and soda I got at the grocery store the other day right over the liberty gal. It's a mighty purty woman washing with short sleeves, said Uncle Billy. That's the comfort of them pictures. You can always get something new, and it adds thickness to the wall. Uncle Jim went back to the cards in silence. After a moment he rose again and hung his overcoat against the door. Wind's coming in, he said briefly. Yes, said Uncle Billy cheerfully, but it wouldn't seem natural if there wasn't that crack in the door to let the sunlight in the mornings. Makes a kind of sundial, you know. When the streak of light's in that corner, I says six o'clock. When it's across the chimney, I say seven, and so tis. It certainly had grown chilly, and the wind was rising. The candle guttered and flickered. The embers on the hearth brightened occasionally, as if trying to dispel the gathering shadows, but always ineffectually. The game was frequently interrupted by the necessity of stirring the fire. After an interval of gloom in which each partner successively drew the candle to his side to examine his cards, Uncle Jim said, Say, well, responded Uncle Billy, are you sure you saw that third crow on the woodpile? Sure as I see you now, and a durn sight plainer. Why? Nothing, I was just thinking. Look here. How do we stand now? Uncle Billy was still losing. Nevertheless, he said cheerfully, I'm owing you a matter of sixty thousand dollars. Uncle Jim examined the book abstractedly. Suppose, he said slowly, but without looking at his partner, suppose, as it's getting late now, we play for my half share of the claim again the limit, seventy thousand to square up. Your half share, repeated Uncle Billy with amused incredulity. My half share of the claim, all of this, your house, you know, one half of all that Dick Bullen calls our rotten starvation property, reiterated Uncle Jim with a half smile. Uncle Billy laughed. It was a novel idea. It was, of course, all in the air, like the rest of their game. Yet even then he had an odd feeling that he would have liked Dick Bullen to have known it. Wade in, old pard, he said. I'm on it. Uncle Jim lit another candle to reinforce the fading light, and the deal fell to Uncle Billy. He turned up Jack of Clubs. He also turned a little redder as he took up his cards, looked at them, and glanced hastily at his partner. It's no use playing, he said. Look here. He laid down his cards on the table. They were the Ace, King, and Queen of Clubs, and Jack of Spades, or Left Bower, which, with the turned-up jack of clubs or right bower, comprised all the winning cards. By jingo, if we'd been playing four-handed, say you and me again some other ducks, we'd have made four in that deal, and heisted some money, eh? And his eyes sparkled. Uncle Jim also had a slight tremulous light in his own. Oh, no, I didn't see no three crows this afternoon, added Uncle Billy gleefully, as his partner in turn began to shuffle the cards with laborious and conscientious exactitude. Then dealing, he turned up a heart for trumps. Uncle Billy took up his cards one by one, but when he had finished, his face had become as pale as it had been red before. What's the matter? said Uncle Jim quickly, his own face growing white. Uncle Billy, slowly and with breathless awe, laid down his cards, face up on the table. It was exactly the same sequence in hearts, with a knave of diamonds added. He could again take every trick. They stared at each other with vacant faces and a half-drawn smile of fear. They could hear the wind moaning in the trees beyond. There was a sudden rattling at the door. Uncle Billy started to his feet. 
But Uncle Jim caught his arm. Don't leave the cards. It's only the wind. Sit down, he said, in a low, awe-hushed voice. It's your deal. You were two before and two now. That makes you four. You've only one point to make to win the game. Go on. They both poured out a cup of whiskey, smiling vaguely, yet with a certain terror in their eyes. Their hands were cold. The card slipped from Uncle Billy's benumbed fingers. When he had shuffled them, he passed them to his partner to shuffle them also, but did not speak. When Uncle Jim had shuffled them methodically, he handed them back fatefully to his partner. Uncle Billy dealt them with a trembling hand. He turned up a club. If you're sure of these tricks, you know you've won, said Uncle Jim in a voice that was scarcely audible. Uncle Billy did not reply, but tremulously laid down the ace and right and left bowers. He had won. A feeling of relief came over each, and they laughed hysterically and discordantly. Ridiculous and childish as their contest might have seemed to a looker-on, to each the tension had been as great as that of the greatest gambler, without the gambler's trained restraint, coolness, and composure. Uncle Billy nervously took up the cards again. Don't, said Uncle Jim gravely. It's no use. The luck's gone now. Just one more deal, pleaded his partner. Uncle Jim looked at the fire. Uncle Billy hastily dealt and threw the two hands face up on the table. They were the ordinary average cards. He dealt again with the same result. I told you so, said Uncle Jim without looking up. It certainly seemed a tame performance after their wonderful hands. And after another trial, Uncle Billy threw the cards aside and drew his stool before the fire. Mighty queer, weren't it? He said with reminiscent awe. Three times running. Do you know, I felt a kind of creepy feeling down my back all the time. Crikey, what luck. None of the boys would believe it if we told them, least of all that Dick Bullen, who don't believe in luck anyway. Wonder what he'd have said. And Lord, how he'd have looked. Wall. What are you staring so for? Uncle Jim had faced around and was gazing at Uncle Billy's good-humored simple face. Nothing, he said briefly, and his eyes again sought the fire. Then don't look as if you were seeing something. You give me the creeps, returned Uncle Billy a little petulantly. Let's turn in afore the fire goes out. The fateful cards were put back into the drawer, the table shoved against the wall, the operation of undressing was quickly got over, the clothes they wore being put on top of their blankets. Uncle Billy yawned. I wonder what kind of a dream I'll have tonight. It ought to be something to explain that luck. This was his good night to his partner. In a few moments he was sound asleep. Not so Uncle Jim. He heard the wind gradually go down, and in the oppressive silence that followed could detect the deep breathing of his companion and the far-off yelp of a coyote. His eyesight becoming accustomed to the semi-darkness, broken only by the scintillation of the dying embers of their fire. He could take in every detail of their sordid cabin and the rude environment in which they had lived so long. The dismal patches on the bark roof, the wretched makeshifts of each day, the dreary prolongation of discomfort were all plain to him now, without the sanguine hope that had made them bearable and when he shut his eyes upon them, it was only to travel in fancy down the steep mountainside that he had trodden so often to the dreary claim on the overflowed river, to the heaps of tailings that encumbered it like empty shells of the hollow, profitless days spent there, which they were always waiting for the stroke of good fortune to clear away. He saw again the rotten sluicing through whose hopeless rifts and holes even their scant daily earnings had become scantier. At last he arose and with infinite gentleness let himself down from his berth without disturbing his sleeping partner, and wrapping himself in his blanket went to the door, which he noiselessly opened. From the position of a few stars that were glittering in the northern sky, he knew that it was yet scarcely midnight. There were still long restless hours before the day. In the feverish state into which he had gradually worked himself, it seemed to him impossible to wait for the coming of the dawn. But he was mistaken, for even as he stood there, all nature seemed to invade his humble cabin with its free and fragrant breath, and invest him with its great companionship. 
he felt again in that breath that strange sense of freedom, that mystic touch of partnership with the birds and beasts, the shrubs and trees, in this greater home before him. It was this vague communion that had kept him there, that still held these world-sick weary workers in their rude cabins on the slopes around him. And he felt upon his brow that balm that had nightly lulled him and them to sleep and forgetfulness. He closed the door, turned away, crept as noiselessly as before into his bunk again, and presently fell into a profound slumber. But when Uncle Billy awoke the next morning, he saw it was late, for the sun, piercing the crack of the closed door, was sending a pencil of light across the cold hearth, like a match to rekindle its dead embers. His first thought was of his strange luck the night before, and of disappointment that he had not had the dream of divination that he had looked for. He sprang to the floor, but as he stood upright his glance fell on Uncle Jim's bunk. It was empty. Not only that, but his blankets, Uncle Jim's own particular blankets, were gone. A sudden revelation of his partner's manner the night before struck him now with the cruelty of a blow. A sudden intelligence, perhaps the very divination that he had sought, flashed upon him like lightning. He glanced wildly around the cabin. The table was drawn out from the wall a little ostentatiously, as if to catch his eye. On it was lying the stained, shamey skin purse in which they had kept the few grains of gold remaining from their last week's clean-up. The grains had been carefully divided, and half had been taken. But near it lay the little memorandum book, open, with a stick of pencil lying across it. A deep line was drawn across the page on which was recorded their imaginary extravagant gains and losses even to the entry of Uncle Jim's half-share of the claim which he had risked and lost. Underneath were hurriedly scrawled the words, Settled by your luck last night, old pard, James Foster. <laughs>